Hello class, this is Chapter 4, Law Enforcement Today. The learning objectives that we're going to cover in this chapter are as follows. We will list the four basic responsibilities of the police, explain how intelligence-led policing works and how it benefits modern police departments. We will identify the differences between the police academy and field training as learning tools for recruits, describe some of the benefits that female police officers bring to law enforcement, identify the main advantage of a racially and ethnically diverse police force, indicate some of the most important law enforcement agencies under the control of the Department of Homeland Security, summarize the duties of the FBI, and analyze the importance of private security today. When it comes to enforcing laws, the police officer role as a crime fighter it has a clear mandate to seek out and apprehend those who have violated the law. Research shows that police officers only spend about half their time enforcing the law or dealing with crimes. The rest of their time is spent on order maintenance and service provision. In terms of providing services, they have a duty to serve the community. There are numerous services performed, including directing traffic, performing emergency medical procedures, counseling those involved in domestic disputes, providing direction for tourists, and finding lost children. Among the first to arrive at disaster scenes to conduct a search and rescue operation is usually the police. Modern society relies on law enforcement officers to control and prevent crime. In the early days, police services had little to do with crime control. Policing efforts of first American cities were directed towards controlling certain groups of people, such as slaves and Native Americans, delivering goods, regulating activities, maintaining health and sanitation, controlling gambling and vice, and managing livestock and other animals. These police services were mostly performed by volunteers. Often volunteers were organized in the night watch system brought over from England by colonists in the 17th century. With the evolution of American law enforcement, night watchmen were required to do little. As the population of American cities grew, however, so did the need for public order. Let's talk about early police departments. In 1833, Philadelphia was the first city to employ both day and night watchmen through reactive patrol units geared towards enforcing the law and preventing crime. Five years later, Boston formed the first organized police department. It consisted of six full-time officers. It was modeled after the London Metropolitan Police. In 1844, New York City set the foundation for the modern police department by combining its day and night watches under the control of a single police chief. In the political area, era, many police officers were hardworking, honest, and devoted to serving and protecting the public. However, as a whole, the quality of American police service was poor in its early years. The reasons are recruitment and promotion of police officers was intricately tied into the politics of the day. Police officers received their jobs as a result of political connections, not because of their skills. Corruption was rampant during the political era of policing from 1840 to 1930. Police salaries were also relatively low. Many officers saw their positions as opportunities to make extra income through illegal activities. Bribery was common, as were favors and contribution, referred to as the patronage system or the spoils system because the political victors gained the spoils. In the reform era, O.W. Wilson and A. Vollmer promoted a style of policing known as the professional model. Police chiefs took more control over their departments. Police departments in many major cities were reorganized. Mid-level positions were added as, to the force as majors or assistant chiefs. They could develop and implement crime-fighting strategies and could more closely supervise individual officers. Police chiefs tried to consolidate their power by bringing large areas of a city under their control. This trend benefited law enforcement agents in numerous ways. It provided an increase in salary, an improvement of working conditions, and women and members of minority groups were given opportunities, ultimately. This trend benefited police administrators because they had a greater extent of control over their officers, controlling effectiveness, 
and discouraging any contact with citizens did, that did not relate to law enforcement. In the community era, the civil rights movement, protests against war in Vietnam, poor relations between the police and African American communities occurred. The community era, era of policing may have started with several government initiatives that took place in 1968. In the 1970s, police administrators were forced to combine efforts to improve community relations with aggressive and innovative crime-fighting strategies. Proactive strategies aim at stopping crimes before they're committed. Community policing is based on interaction between officers and citizens developing into a partnership for preventing and fighting crime. Policing today involves intelligence, terrorism, and technology. Many law enforcement experts believe that the 9-11 attacks ended the community era of policing. Emphasis has now shifted to counterterrorism and surveillance through technology. The collection, analyzation, and mapping of crime data has become a hallmark of law enforcement in the 21st century, and not without dispute. Policing today Focus is again on intelligence, terrorism, and technology. And intelligence led policing says that behavior is not as random as we think, that we can rely on data concerning past crime patterns to predict future crime patterns. The benefits are that it allows police departments to be more effective in responding to and deterring crime while using fewer resources. The challenges of counterterrorism, the need to focus scarce resources to prevent and fight crimes that are relatively uncommon is an ongoing need. Dealing with the scrutiny that comes with crimes often have an international implication and the difficult task of gathering information about crimes before they happen is also a challenge. Hard and soft power help with these challenges. Law Enforcement 2.0 says that there is more of an emphasis on online investigations and intelligence and technology while on the beat, or the use of technology on the beat. Discussion question number one. Many law enforcement agencies have their officers go undercover and create fake social media profiles on Instagram and Facebook to be able to connect with people who are committing illegal activities. What are the pros associated with this police practice? And what are the cons associated with this police practice? Does it involve entrapment, perhaps? Now let's talk about recruitment and training. The basic requirements are that the person must have U.S. citizenship, no previous felony convictions, an eligibility for a driving license, be at least 21 years of age, meet minimum weight and sight requirements, pass background checks and tests, pass drug tests. There's also a review of education, military and driving records, credit checks, interviews with spouses, acquaintances and previous employers, a physical agility or fitness test, educational requirements. And 82% of all local police departments require at least a high school diploma. Recruits with college or university experience are generally thought to have an advantage in hiring and promotion. The probationary period lasts six to 18 months, and that includes academy training, controlled militarized environment, laws of search and seizure, arrest and interrogation, use of weapons, procedures of securing crime scenes, procedures of interviewing witnesses, first aid, self-defense, terrorism related training in the field, and a recruit is paired with an experienced police officer or FTO, which is a field training officer. Discussion question number two. What age should be the minimum and maximum for a starting police officer? What is the minimum education level you should think that all starting officers should possess? Now let's talk about anti-discrimination law and affirmative action. The 1964 Civil Rights Act and its 1972 amendment guaranteed members of minority groups and women equal access to jobs in law enforcement. The establishment of the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission, EEOC, played a role as well. Affirmative action programs were developed to increase the diversity of law enforcement employees. 
by giving certain advantages to women and members of minority groups in the hiring process. As far as working women, gender and law enforcement provided added scrutiny. Women hold relatively few leadership positions in American policing. Women must deal with the assumption that they are physically weak, mentally soft, and generally unsuited for the rigors of the job. Male officers try to protect female officers by keeping them out of hazardous situations, thereby denying them the opportunity to prove themselves. Then there's tokenism, which is the belief that they've been hired or promoted to fulfill their diversity requirements and not have earned their position on their own merit. Discussion question number three. Are males or females better with each of the following responsibilities of the police? Would you care about the gender or ethnicity of your police partner to enforce the law, provide services, prevent crime, and preserve the peace? Now let's talk about the minority report, which is race and ethnicity in law enforcement. There's a double marginality. White police officers believe that minority officers will give members of their own race or ethnicity better treatment on the streets. These same minority officers face hostility from members of their own community who are under the impression that black and Hispanic officers are traitors to their race or ethnicity. But the benefits, however, of a diverse police force mean that an integrated police force could develop a better relationship with the community and therefore do a more effective job maintaining law and order. Then there's the multi-layering of law enforcement, which consists of a wide network of local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies. There are over 18,000 law enforcement agencies in the United States employing more than 1.1 million people. Approximately 880,000 sworn law enforcement officers are on duty today and operate on three different levels, local, state, and federal. The multi-layering of law enforcement consists of a wide network of local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies. Municipal law enforcement agencies have the broadest authority to apprehend criminal suspects, maintain order, and provide services to the community. They're ultimately responsible for a wide spectrum of duties. Then you have sheriff and county law enforcement. The sheriff is an important figure in American law enforcement. Almost every one of more than 3,000 counties in the United States, except those in Alaska, have one in the majority of states. They are elected officials, and as elected officials, they may not have a law enforcement background. They're also politicians. So the size and responsibility of the sheriff's departments vary in size. Most are assigned duties by state law. 80% of sheriff's departments have the primary responsibility for investigating violent crimes in their jurisdiction. Other common responsibilities include investigating drug crimes, maintaining the county jail, carrying out civil and criminal processes within county lines, keeping order in the county courthouse, collecting taxes, enforcing orders of the court, and they're also tied in with the county coroner, also known as the medical examiner. The coroner is an elected official on the county level and has a general mandate to investigate all sudden, unexplained, unnatural, or suspicious deaths reported to the office. They're ultimately responsible for determining the cause of death. They perform autopsies and assist in homicide investigations. Then you have state police and highway patrols. These were created for three reasons. They assist local police agencies, investigate criminal activities that cross jurisdictions, and provide law enforcement in rural and other areas without local police. State police agencies have statewide jurisdiction and are authorized to perform a wide variety of law enforcement tasks. State highway patrols have limited authority with regard to their jurisdiction or by the offenses that they have the authority to control. Federal law enforcement agencies do not make up a large part of the nation's law enforcement force, and the Department of Homeland Security was created through the Homeland Security Act signed by President George W. Bush in November of 2002. Functions, it functions as a cabinet-level department designed to coordinate federal efforts to protect the United States against international and domestic terrorism. 
22 existing agencies were shifted under the control of the Secretary of Homeland Security, and the three most visible agencies under DHS are U.S. Customs and Border Protection, which keeps illegal immigrants, drugs, and drug traffickers from crossing borders, facilitating the smooth flow of legal trade and travel. The U.S. Border Patrol serves as a branch of the CPB. Also, there's the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, which implements laws concerning customs and immigration into the United States, detaining and deporting illegal aliens, ensuring that individuals without permission do not work or gain benefits in the United States, and helps to disrupt human trafficking. The third is the U.S. Secret Service, which was created in 1865 to be primarily responsible for combating currency counterfeiters. It's given additional responsibility of protecting the U.S. President, the President's family, the victim, President, the President-elect, and former Presidents. In 1901, it has also become responsible for protecting political figures. It directs two uniform groups of law enforcement, the Secret Service Uniform Division, which protects the grounds of the White House and its inhabitants, and the Treasury Police Force, which policies or polices the Treasury Building in Washington, D.C. There are additional DHS agencies, which are the U.S. Coast Guard, the Transportation Security Administration, or TSA, and the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA. The Department of Justice created in 1870, and its job is to primarily provide law enforcement agency in the country and is responsible for enforcing criminal law and supervising federal prisons. It has a number of law enforcement agencies. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, which was initially created in 1908. And it has jurisdiction over nearly 200 federal crimes, including a number of white collar crimes, espionage, kidnapping, extortion, interstate transportation of stolen property, bank robbery, interstate gambling, and civil rights violations. It also combats terrorism and drug trafficking. The National Crime Information Center, or NCIC, provides lists of stolen vehicles and firearms, missing license plates, vehicles used to commit crimes, and other information to local and state law enforcement agencies. The Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA, mission is to enforce domestic drug laws and regulations and to assist other federal and foreign agencies in combating illegal drug manufacture and trade on the international level. It enforces provisions of the Controlled Substances Act. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives, or ATF, is concerned with the illegal sale, possession, and use of firearms and the control of untaxed tobacco and liquor products. It regulates all gun trade between the United States and foreign nations and collects taxes on importers, manufacturers, and dealers, and is responsible for policing the illegal use and possession of explosives. It's also charged with enforcing federal gambling laws. And then you have the U.S. Marshal Service, which is the oldest federal law enforcement agency. It was initially charged with the responsibility to protect the U.S. Attorney General, but its main duties today are to provide security at federal courts for judges, jurors, and other courtroom participants. The control property that has been seized by federal courts is also its responsibility, and it protects government witnesses who have placed themselves in danger by testifying. Transport of federal prisoners to detention institutions is another one of its responsibilities, along with the investigation of violations of federal fugitive laws. The Department of the Treasury was formed in 1789 and is mainly responsible for all financial matters of the financial government. It pays all the government's bills, borrows money, collects taxes, mints coins, and prints paper currency. The largest bureau is the Internal Revenue Service, or IRS, concerned with violations of tax law and regulations. Private security today. Even with increasing numbers of local, state, and federal law enforcement officers, police do not have the ability to prevent every crime. Privatizing law enforcement means that ideally a security guard should only observe and report criminal activity unless use of force is needed to prevent a felony. Private security is not designed to replace law enforcement. It is intended to deter crime rather than stop it. Secondary policing means it's an umbrella term that covers 
the work that off-duty cops do when quote-unquote moonlighting for private companies or government agencies. As far as continued health in the industry, indicators have pointed to a higher growth in the industry, and there are four factors driving this growth. Increase in fear on the part of the public triggered by a growing crime rate, perceived or real. The problems of crime in the workplace, budget cuts in states and municipalities that have forced reductions in public police, and rising awareness of private security products. Class, as always, we thank you for your time. That is all for this chapter. Thank you so much again, and we will see you in Chapter 5.